Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to the audience. We're just going to give it another minute just to, to get everyone in and then we'll get started. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us um, tonight uh, in Palestine, uh, this morning in Australia, and I believe afternoon in Canada, uh, which is where we, we all are, all the speakers are. This is the uh, second uh, webinar in the Shabaka and FMAP series, Learning and Unlearning Palestine. And today we're gonna to be talking about limited paradigms. So we're gonna be looking at various paradigms that in spite of their, their liberal uh, facade um, have actually sought to contain the Palestinian experience and limit critique on the Israeli settler colonial project. Um, and joining me to discuss this are two brilliant scholars uh, and colleagues, uh, Dr. Lana Tatur, lecturer in development at the School of Social Sciences, uh, UNSW Sydney. Uh, Lana, what does UNSW stand uh, for? University of New Wales. South Wales. Okay, thank you. University of New South Wales, Sydney. Um, Lana works on settler colonialism, indigeneity, race, citizenship, human rights, uh, and the Middle East, with a particular focus on Palestine and the Israeli regime. And our second speaker is Dr. Mohanna Dayash, Professor of Sociology at Mount Royal University in Canada. Mohanad works on settler colonial sovereignty, decolonial sovereignties, political violence, and social movements with a focus on Palestine and the Israeli regime. Um, so thank you to both of you for joining me across these massively uh, different time zones. I'm really, really excited to have uh, both of you on this, this uh, webinar because I deeply respect your work in general, but also because I think your particular insight on this topic uh, is critical. Um, now, we know that in, in Palestine, there has been no shortage of, of paradigms and frameworks uh, thrown at us. And, and in some cases, as Palestinians, we've adopted them and found strengths in them. And in other cases, we've had to navigate their limitations. So I want to start with the, the dominant framework in which most, most mo mainstream spaces, NGOs, human rights groups, academia, etc., has adopted as a prism through which to analyze and talk about Palestine. Uh, and that is international law. Now, of course, uh, we're not lawyers, uh, neither are we necessarily international law specialists, but as Palestinians, we all come very well versed in international law and we've had to be. So perhaps I can start off this conversation by asking you both, how, how did international law become such a prevailing framework in Palestine? Who would like to start? Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, um, having us and thank you for uh, all those who are taking the time uh, to attend today and thank you for organizing this wonderful uh, uh, um, event. I'm really looking forward to being in conversation uh, uh, with you and with the participants. I'm joining you from stolen Gadigal land that is uh, on Sydney. Um, and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and uh, of course a commitment, a strong commitment to land uh, back. Uh, speaking of international law, I think it's it's quite a, as you said, I, I don't come from, from a law background, um, neither does Muhammad or you, but you're right in, in, in pointing that international law is such a central part of every Palestinian, right? You don't need to be an expert in international law. It governs our lives in so many different ways and it has been governing our lives. Certainly uh, uh, also looking at the, you know, at the ascent of uh, Zionism, the Balfour Declaration, the investigative committees uh, on Palestine and the ways in which the question of Palestine have been managed uh, through imperial period uh, uh, and 
uh, afterwards was really through the exercise of international law, um, thinking about the partition plan and, and uh, the League of Nations and then the UN. Uh, we have a host of institutions that really have made decisions about our land, about our lives, uh, uh, without uh, uh, as if we don't exist. It's not just a question of consultation. It is a question of uh, um, the ways in which these these the question of Palestine has been governed by these institutions and the different procedural uh, um, mechanisms that they have implemented has completely rationalized Palestinians as incapable of deciding their destiny, um, as inferior, as people whose faith could be decided by others. Um, and I think this is the context in which we have been as Palestinians operating. First of all, seeking to make a difference, to, to have a voice, to have a stake in these processes. We couldn't, despite the fact that you know, this arena has been structured against us, really playing a key role in our oppression. This is not an arena that we could have abandoned, given how important it is, it was and remains in governing our lives. We also recognize that this is an arena that is being really shaped by, you know, it, by different circumstances, political, historical, economic and so on um, um, and changing circumstances. And we constantly adapted the ways in which we are engaging with international law. Um, and I think here the 60s and the 70s are really a key turning point uh, where we as Palestinians, Palestinian liberation organization really sought recognition, but not within the framework, the framework uh, uh, necessarily of the liberal recognition that we know today in seeking uh, legitimacy and place within really an environment then that had so much hope in the UN with decolonization and anti-colonial movements uh, um, taking, uh, you know, really trying to change the ways in which international order is um, is structured and we were part of it. And there is the famous Arafat speech uh, um, in the UN and there is the famous resolution on Zionism is racism. And we managed to make really some significant achievements in this period uh, uh, through our allies. Today we are in a different, and maybe I'll finish with that because I know we have you know the entire webinar to talk about it. Um, but today we are also in a different uh, space where we recognize that international law is constantly remade and is made, and we are part of this conversation. On the one hand, we want to engage in international law, and the other hand, we don't want international law to be what is governing our struggle, what is governing, uh, what is shaping or governing our demands. We don't want it to be, you know, the ceiling. Uh, uh, we want it to be another arena in which we struggle. And I think that the contestations that exist today within the Palestinian uh, uh, um, liberation movement or solidarity movement around meanings of what is apartheid or how can we understand apartheid or indigeneity uh, and so on and so forth are part of really our attempt to shape international law and to uh, uh, struggle on the ways in which uh, um, uh, it gives meanings to our struggle, but also putting boundaries to the ways in which it can impose itself on us in a really, really uh, uh, compromising way. And also recognizing that it is international law is not necessarily always on the side of the oppressed. So it is an arena of also uh, uh, contestation with imperial and colonial and racial capitalist uh, um, uh, powers who are also engaging and oppressive, you know, right wing groups who are engaging also international law. Israel is engaging international law in its struggle. So it is it is not necessarily a tool only of the oppressed. It's an arena of contestation. Yes. Do you want me to jump in, Yara? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, go okay. ahead. 
So, so first of all, thank you so much uh, for inviting me and for organizing this. Uh, thank you to the Al Shabaka, to the Foundation for Middle East Peace. It's it's an absolute pleasure to be on this panel with with uh, people whose uh, work I certainly admire. Both of yours. Uh, it's so so I'm I'm really happy to be here. Um, and first of all, I would also like to 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 acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the homelands of the Nitsitapi, the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, the Kani, and Kainai, uh, the Iyahe Nakoda, uh, and the Sutina uh, nations. Um, and, and this will be a theme throughout my talk, really. Uh, um, uh, these are their homelands. I, I don't really care much about what international law recognized as a sovereign state. That means nothing to me. <laughs> these are their homelands, always have been, always will be. Uh, um, that's, that's where I find meaning, that's where I find justice. Um, and, and really, I have nothing to add to, to what uh, uh, Lana said. I, I totally agree with everything she said there in terms of how it came about that we use international law. And I want to be clear that I wholeheartedly support all legal scholars, particularly Palestinian legal scholars, anti-colonial and anti-racist legal scholars, and, and activists and lawyers who have done a, a tremendous work in entering this arena and trying to affect change to advance the Palestinian struggle through this arena. It is, it is, there is some openness in this arena. Uh, uh, and it should be approached like other arenas in which we carry out our struggle. So, so I wholeheartedly support that. But I also want us to have a sober assessment of what this arena, where this arena is. So let me start by just a very quick uh, 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 a quote from, from the uh, recent uh, United Nations Independent International Commission of Inquiry on the Occupied Palestinian Territory. So this is, this is the commission report that then led to the uh, sort of uh, the, the UN Ge General Resolution to then ask the International Court of Justice to take, uh, um, uh, to, 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 to advise on the legal consequences of, of, of the occupation. Um, but, but let me just quote from, so I mean the report is good, but, but let me just quote this to, to show us where we are. So this report in 2022 is 74 years after 1948, 74. It's 55 years after 67. The radical, sorry, the quote unquote, sort of radical re conclusion of this report is, and I quote, there are reasonable grounds to conclude that the Israeli occupation of Palestinian territory is now, I'm emphasizing the now, they don't emphasize, is now unlawful under international law. International law is an arena that is just now starting to say there is grounds to think that what has been happening for 55 years of brutal military settler colonial occupation of 74 years of settler colonial conquest of over 100 years of brutal Zionist aggression and colonization of the land of Palestine. They're just now thinking it might be illegal. That's that's where we are in that arena. Um, so so I'm not celebrating that. I'm not celebrating that as a as a huge you know uh, um, validation of us. Uh, uh, we've been saying these things for over a hundred years. Uh, we, we don't need the validation of international law to know that what we're saying is the truth. Now again, approach this this arena, uh, um, uh, uh, work within it use it to dispel Israeli propaganda, of which there is plenty. Um, so again, and even this, the, the commission report that I'm citing for, from has some good information that can be used by activists. I'm all for that. So, so, so please don't misunderstand me. But, you know, part of the, the language in this report as well, there's this constant talk about, throughout the document, things that are happening now are quote unquote leading to permanent occupation and annexation. What leading to? It's been, it's been, it's been that since 1948. Uh, uh, so, so, you know, these, the, it's, it's these sorts of little points that sometimes go unnoticed, I think, by, by, many, by many commentators and some activists even, um, that, that, that need to be highlighted so that we have, again, a sober assessment of what this arena entails, where we're at in it, um, and, and how much we should expect from it. Um, so, so I'll end my first comments uh, there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both so much for that. And, you know, Lana, something that you said really struck with me that this is, you know, also an arena that has been structured against us. And then we kind of always assume that it's going to be on the, the side of the oppressed. And I think the last 
three decades, so much energy and hope has been placed in international law by Palestinians and Palestinian civil society. And I think we're reaching a point now where Palestinians are completely disillusioned and frustrated with it because the material um, uh, gains have been so limited and also because you know we're seeing and you know this is down because of imp implementation um, but we're also seeing you know it's also about political will of the powerful states and we just have to look at the west's reaction to ukraine uh, and russia's invasion of ukraine um, and i think you know for, for for palestinians like it's really um, you know, when we talk about international law, we also, you know, are talking about the bare minimum, you know, we're not talking about like a ceiling, we're talking about the very bare minimum. And, and international law, you know, it doesn't account for, for the most part, it doesn't account for colonial situations. And why is that? It's because, you know, the, the majority of people who were behind uh, international law and international law conventions are formal colonial powers or current colonial powers. Uh, and so the provisions for colonial situations, for settler colonial situations within the international law are incredibly limited um, and, and do not uh, give you know, uh, much power to colonized or indigenous people. And that's not by coincidence, that's definitely by design. But before we talk about colonialism and, and, and settler colonialism, I want us to think a little bit about you know, what, what I said earlier about Palestinians sort of seeing international law as the bare minimum, you know, what does this tell us about the limitations of international law? How far can we go with international law? Um, it's a really good question, right? Uh, I don't think that international law has liberated any nation. It has been important tool and I, again, I'm not against the use of international law, and I don't think we need to abandon that space. But liberation does not come from international law. Uh, this is not the space. And as you said, international law is constrained by international politics. And we know that international politics is good against us. We know the imperial and colonial and racial legacies that really shape the space of uh, uh, international law. Uh, and as you said, it's not coincidence that international law doesn't address, uh, it would recognize uh, uh, settlements in an occupied territory, right, as illegal, but settler colonialism per se is not illegal. And that goes back to Muhammad's, the way he started uh, uh, his talk. Well, I don't care what, what international law, law says, this is the land of you know, uh, the First Nations in which I am in. I don't care if it's recognized by international law uh, or not. And I think this is the key point. Uh, uh, the key point is what expectations do we have from international law? Um, and I think also this is where the disappointment come, right? If we have expectations that international law is going to, to lead to a material, real impact on the ground, then we are bound to be disappointed. But if, our, if we understand international law as a space where sometimes we can make gains in which we can mobilize in our struggle in certain spaces, then our expectations are not you know, as high uh, in the ways in which we understand what are the limits of international law uh, but also put our own boundaries uh, to what international law should make. So I'm thinking about, uh, and maybe we can go into the critique of the apartheid uh, uh, understanding under international law later, but I'm thinking about the, um, you know, the apartheid uh, uh, reports, both by uh, human rights organizations and by the UN, and there's a difference in the ways in which they understand apartheid, certainly recently and under uh, um, uh, the special rapporteur on Palestinian territories, Francesca Albanese. But they have been, uh, and I see that when you appeal to liberal space in liberal spaces, they've been useful. Uh, they've been useful to a certain extent. They also have limited our struggle, but they have been useful to, to a certain extent. And I think this is where it gets a bit tricky. Again, it's an arena that we need to engage. 
But the question is, how do you mobilize um, some of your gains in that space? And I would say that the recognition, even if it's not in the way, the absolute way that we want it, of Israel as an apartheid state, is um, is an achievement. Uh, we've been saying that for decades. Um, but also, uh, uh, where do we where do we not let that define uh, um, define our struggle? Um, and how do we keep pushing for reinterpretations of international law that fit our agenda rather than work within the space that international law creates? So us also as shapers of international uh, law. Yeah, and, and again, and I agree with that, with with what Lana is saying. Uh, uh, I'll add this. You know, to me, the, the main limitations of international law are, are twofold. There are there are a few, but I'll, I'll 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 focus on two. Number one is that it does treat mostly these these actions by the Israeli state or any other uh, uh, state committing these kinds of crimes. If if use them as as purely criminal problems. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, one of the courts, the other one, not the, um, the one that I just named, the other one, <laughs> the International Criminal Court, it, it, it only, as far as I know, it only uh, treats crimes as committed by individuals even, not even by states. So it, it doesn't actually address political context. So it doesn't address the larger questions of settler colonialism and the political structures that underpin uh, Israeli settler colonial conquest of Palestine. So that's one major limitation. The other major limitation um, uh, is, is uh, um, well, there's three, sorry. So the other major, major limitation is enforcement. Uh, um, it, it all depends. International law cannot be enforced except through basically the Security Council. And the Security Council is purely political uh, as is international law because it can't be enforced. Um, uh, so, so, uh, uh, so even if we do get rulings in our favor, um, I'm not holding my breath that the Security Council will act on them because uh, the last thing that the Security Council does is act on principle. It does not. It acts purely in the self-interest of the uh, uh, American imperial hegemony. Um, so, and then the third point, the third limitation of, of international law um, is that it, it, it does not speak to justice. Uh, there is an important, I may not be a legal scholar, but I do you know, study philosophies of law which are just as important. I'm sorry, but legal scholars don't hold uh, a monopoly over discussions about the law. <laughs> um, other, other scholars and, and everyday people affected by the law have every right to intervene in these discussions. Um, and and uh, um, uh, from, from the perspective of philosophies of law, uh, uh, the law cannot ever capture justice, whether you're talking about international law or any other law, whether state, local, whatever. Uh, it cannot actually capture justice. Justice is always something that exceeds law. Law tries to, to claim as if it does capture justice, as if it does in its enactment, you know, fulfill justice. Uh, and in some cases it, it can partially, but justice is always something that exceeds the law. And we've seen this throughout human history in all sorts of contexts where people oppose unjust law through the name of justice. The reason they're able to do that is because the law cannot capture justice. Um, and, and this is, and, and there, I mean, the, the, the case of Israel is ripe with, with such examples. Um, and, and to me, uh, justice is a much more, uh, um, uh, has, has a much greater potential for, for proper radical transformation, because that is what is needed here. Israel doesn't, you can't fix this problem by slapping Israel on the wrist. Nobody's doing that, by the way, <laughs> to be clear. But even if people were, slapping them on the wrist won't resolve any of these issues. And, and, and we'll, we'll get into that in more detail once we discuss the, 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 the paradigm of settler colonialism. Uh, uh, but, but justice is something that is experienced in, in people's everyday lives, uh, in people's uh, 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 suffering under, under these state violences that they experience on a daily basis in Palestine, on their aspirations for freedom, what they understand justice to be. That's where justice is located, not in these courts. So I follow that. I follow that as our potential for, for, for true liberation, for a true understanding of the problems that are, uh, or, or of the structures of violence that, that uh, um, um, uh, uh, brutalize Palestinian lives, and then as the uh, path for uh, uh, potential decolonization uh, of, of Palestine and, in, and indeed uh, the whole region. Um, uh, um, so, so to me, those are those are all parts of the, 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 the three main limitations of international law and why we should always uh, view it, in my opinion, as a strategic arena, uh, uh, as an arena where we deploy strategic uh, uh, moves in order to advance our cause. Uh, uh, but we must continue basing our struggle in the, ex in the lived experiences of people and their calls for justice, not the law. 
I can, if I can just add about uh, on that for like one minute, I think it's really important. And um, I always, you know, it, it takes me back uh, to a key text that was written years ago, uh, you know, before the whole discussion on apartheid, et cetera, by uh, Ms. Nakato and Karim Rabir on the limitations of law, uh, of international law. And they have warned on the ways in which international law have been really uh, 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 reshaping uh, uh, the discourse of um, social, you know, the solidarity movements um, and of uh, the struggle uh, uh, for Palestine. Um, and they've talked about the ways in which international law is turning the Palestinian question into an issue of rights. Um, and I think this is really, really key intervention and key point. Um, and goes again to that tension between liberal rights and what does it mean to understand Palestine through a liberal frame? And we've done that for so long, especially, you know, the 80s liberal peace. And uh, now we're talking about citizenship for all, which is another liberal frame um, and so on and so forth. And between thinking about Palestine as a colonial question that requires uh, uh, decolonization. Lana, thanks for sharing that that last point. And Mohanan, the point on justice is is so important, and I and I want us to maybe unpack that a bit a little bit later in the the discussion. Um, but moving on just a little bit, so one of the the main paradigms that the international law has given us um, is that of military occupation, and of course everyone knows very well the term OPT, the Occupied Palestinian Territory, is referring to just. Uh, Palestinian lands that were occupied in, in 1967. Um, but activists, organizers, uh, and many of us, you know, have, have long explained how the concept of, of military occupation is not expansive enough to describe the Palestinian experience, not least because geographically it doesn't even cover the whole territory of, of colonized Palestine. But the term is really wedded to our language, you know, even in Arabic, uh, Palestinians still refer to to refer to the Israeli regime. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, considering the, the increased use of the of the settler colonial analysis, which explains uh, the situation in Palestine, is this continuous process of colonial erasure from the the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. Does this paradigm, does this concept of military occupation, become redundant? <laughs> Go for did it. To, did you want to switch uh, it up? Manna, no, no, Manna, take, take it. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Uh, we'll switch it up. Um, uh, so, I mean, the first thing that, it, that the limitations of military occupation, of course, it erases 48. That, that's the main limitation of it. Um, it, it naturalizes the, the settler colonial conquest uh, of, uh, that took place in 1948. And, and uh, it, 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 it starts with 1967 as the starting point of a, a quote unquote solution, the two state solution, which is a shimmer and, and, and all the rest of it. Uh, um, now, I, I do want so, so to, so to me, uh, military occupation, I mean, uh, um, I view it as, as I view apartheid, as we'll discuss shortly, as, as a step along the continuum of settler colonial context. So the, the underlying structure is always settler colonial expulsion of Palestinians from their lands and, and the replacement with settlers, uh, uh, Israeli Jewish settlers. Um, so within that, of course, it, it goes through many different stages and many different uh, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, practices and, and logics and, and, and institutions and whatever. Uh, and part of that is military occupation um, uh, that, that started in 1967. Um, uh, um, now, in terms of, you know, I, to me, like I find this a little bit tricky, the, the debate about what, what people on the ground are using. Yeah, because of course, you're absolutely right that many people in Palestine, including myself, when I grew up uh, uh, in the 1980s and 1990s in Palestine, uh, early 1990s, uh, um, uh, we used ihtilal all the time, right? Uh, uh, so, so but, but to me, you know, and I'm going to speak about this more personally because I don't want to uh, uh, generalize about others. Uh, um, but, but to me, I never thought too much about 
do these what do these words sound like and look like and what effects do they produce in these international law institutions or in state institutions or whatever you use these words because everybody else was using them but you understood with everyone else what the substance of those words were talking to and we knew that what they were talking to was the brutalization of Palestinians, our uh, racialization as inferior beings who do not belong to the land, as people who Israel would like to see expelled and removed from the land. Like we understood ihtilal for me as, as all of those things. So we basically understood it as settler colonial con conquest in our sort of, you know, personal understandings and collective understandings of these issues without knowing or paying much attention, especially I was a very young child of knowing like, oh, there's effects of these words and legal definitions and states and all of that. So, I, but I do think that I'm not alone in this. I don't think, I do think that this happens all the time. Um, so, uh, I, 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 and, and as, all, as well, like we have to keep in mind that, that a colonized populations go, do go through a process of constantly having uh, um, uh, collective debates about what, what concepts are best used to describe their experience. Um, but often when those change, uh, in, in my view, the substance does not. Uh, the substance does remain uh, uh, focused on, on how we are racialized as inferior beings, on how, we, how Israel wants to expel us and remove us. Like it, it, I, I didn't need to read our academic articles or read international law to know from you know, age eight, that Israel does not want me there. It was so obvious to me that they don't want me there or my family there or anyone else who was Palestinian. Like, that's just so obvious. Uh, so, so I do want to warn against, um, uh, you know, uh, applying um, the way we understand these words to, to do have important effects. So we should have these debates uh, uh, in, in, the, in these institutions, such as international law. But, but distinguish that a little bit from the words that are used on the streets to describe our experience, because often when we get to the definitions, we'll find that what they're talking about is very different than what that term has come to look like in a state discourse or an international institution. So, Mahana, that, that last point is so spot on, because when you, you know, if you interrogate someone in Palestine on the street, or perhaps that's the wrong word to use, but when you converse with someone on the street, um, about what they mean by ihtilal, they will explain to you this is, you know, a continuous process of erasure and perhaps not in those terms either, but they will talk about al al um, and, and the, you know, the meaning and the understanding behind it is a lot deeper. And I think, you know, most Palestinians, when they use the word ihtilal, occupation in Arabic, they're not thinking of it in that sort of uh, very limited uh, international law framework. Lana, go ahead. I don't have much to add. I think, you know, that point was absolutely a key point. Uh, uh, the gap between the ways in which Palestinians articulate and understand their reality uh, and international law. Uh, and this is the gap that we really need to tackle, right? Uh, and we need to recognize and we need to keep emphasizing and keep pushing, make it visible and keep pushing uh, um, international law to take seriously. And I'm saying international law, but I'm talking about inter about human rights experts, about human rights organizations. So when I say international law, it sounds really abstract, but it has, you know, agents made of institutions and people. Um, so when we say that this gap exists, it doesn't exist out of the blue. It's not a natural gap. It is a gap that is being made and remade by people, by the international human rights community who is not attentive to the local discourse or discourses in Palestine. And I think this is where uh, we see, you know, this is where we see also um, and that's not unique to, to Palestinians, but we see the frustration with human rights. It's not just about that it's not bringing in real material, you know, change, but it is also about uh, um, the elitist nature of human rights work that leaves the ordinary, you know, ordinary people who are experiencing settler colonialism, occupation, apartheid, segregation on a daily basis as either treating them as databases for their reports, um, but not 
as those who need to, you know, not as discourse producers, not as shapers of these reports, but as the material that is being used for this report, for these reports. And, uh, and I think, you know, uh, here I think Mohanad's point is really crucial and we need to keep holding uh, 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 human rights organizations accountable uh, the fact that you know they, they're saying apartheid is not enough. How are you? You know how are you engaging with people? Uh, where do people fit um, in your work? Are you speaking over people or are you speaking with people? And again, the database versus the shapers. And I think yeah. So thank you, Mohana, for this. Lana, I want to stick with you a little bit, um, seeing as you you started talking about apartheid, um, and we know you know apartheid has gained momentum. Um, the term apartheid has gained momentum recently in the context of Palestine because these various human rights groups that you mentioned um, have started prescribing the Israeli regime, regime as such, but it's actually been you know a framework or a prism. Um, that has long been used to describe the situation in Palestine. Um, it's got this long history in Palestinian discourse and intellectual production, um, which was forged by the, the solidarity with the black struggle in South Africa um, and the recognition of very similar structures of oppression. Um, but since its, its codification in the Rome Statute of the, the International Criminal Court in 2002, the apartheid framework has heavily relied on this this rights-based discourse, which presumes the centrality of international law, um, and therefore, you know, the the notion that justice will will be achieved with the application of said law. Um, but as I just mentioned, apartheid, you know, has this much longer history, and it hasn't always been understood in those terms, in those very narrow terms. And actually, Lana, you and I did a podcast. Um, on this quite um, quite some time ago uh, for Shabaka on the um, on this uh, liberal usage of apartheid as you described it. So I was wondering if perhaps you could start us off by talking us through that that critique of how uh, apartheid has been watered down uh, in a sense. Uh, thank you. I think that um, when it comes to apartheid, and you know, many others have made this critique as well. Um, um, when I wrote about it, it first, it was when um, B'Tselem, the Israeli Human Rights Organization, uh, released its uh, its report that Israel, you know, came to the realization that Israel is an apartheid state, following a very long time in which it was attacking Palestinian organizations in private meetings and publicly, uh, you know, delegitimizing as radical for their for their approach, uh, but without taking any accountability as to their role in suppressing that discourse for a really long time. Side note, that was me venting. Uh, but I think the when this report came out and it was for people who are, you know, versed in the international human rights uh, uh, community, we knew that more reports are coming out on Israeli apartheid um, by international human rights organizations. Um, and this report was the first report, but the reports shared the very clear understanding of apartheid under international law, uh, which is a system of racial discrimination. Um, divorced of um, divorced of colonial uh, domination and settler colonialism. So it was a very liberal reading of apartheid that really focused on the ways in which Israel has created different systems of rule um, and differentiated regimes of rights for Israelis and Palestinians. But if, as if this creation has come out of nowhere, that it has no ideological basis, that there is no overarching project behind, uh, behind uh, apartheid, which is settler colonialism and Zionism. Um, and I, I think probably Mohanad will speak more about settler colonialism, but what I wanna say is, um, Looking at all the critiques that were made 
since the Batsalem report. It is remarkable how much power we have had as Palestinian solidarity movement, as a Palestinian movement, as Palestinian activists, Palestinian scholars, uh, in really intervening in that discourse and putting a, a very uh, forceful objection to the liberal framing of apartheid um, as a liberal question. Um, and we see this impact in the recent reports that have been published by the Special Rapporteur on, on Palestine, Francesca Albanese, and her talks and her statements, which link directly apartheid as, as to settler colonialism and seeing settler colonialism as the overarching uh, uh, framework in which apartheid is taking place, I would add also occupation um, um, is taking place. Um, so, you know, this critique had uh, influence. We had an influence of the ways in which some of this discourse is starting to change within institutions. Where now I think our next forefront needs to be is about Zionism. Settler colonialism is good, but the question is how do you read settler colonialism? If you read settler colonialism without a critique of Zionism as a colonial and racial movement, then we have gone only so far. We don't want liberal reading of settler colonialism. We want, you know, uh, we want to tackle the core, and that's the Zionist project. I want to see the organizations push for a recognition of Zionism as racism. I want them to really see in international law, taking in by international organizations and so on and so forth, taking the apartheid discourse to the next stage and linking, linking it to Zionism. Because as long as Zionism remains a legitimate project, Settler colonialism remains a legitimate project. There is no way around it. You don't have Zionism without settler colonialism. I know that Peter Beinart is trying. It's impossible. It is impossible. Um, so I'd like us to see, to now start pushing towards that direction. Again, building on our intellectual legacy. And this is, you know, this is also work that Nora Arikat has been doing. She's done fabulous work on, you know, recovering. Uh, some of the work that Palestinians have done around their racism is um, around the resolution racism is uh, um, Zionism is racism and and talking about this. So uh, we have an impact and I think we can now start pushing the discourse uh, uh, a bit further on this. Yeah, and I, I just uh, one of the things that I absolutely loved about what Lana said uh, um, is that we don't we don't just concede these concepts to their liberal, you know, uh, the, the liberal version of them, right? Like, uh, uh, we don't just say, well, they've ruined apartheid, they've ruined settler colonialism, I can't use it anymore. Let, don't do that. I don't like that approach. Like, let's continue to, to claim those for what they, you know, establish the meaning of those things for what they actually are, not the liberal diluted version of them, which is always comes in to, to, to be, basically maintain the status quo. Um, uh, and um, uh, you know, and 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 also building on on what Lana uh, is saying, um, it, it, we see this all the time. Palestinian scholars and activists and communities articulate the the context properly and accurately. It gets ignored, and then 30, 40, 50 years later, they'll come this to, to the conclusion that we've already said that many years ago, and then they'll say, "Oh, look at how great." You know, for example, look how great these Israeli histor revisionist historians who have finally shown the mythology of Israel's founding. Yeah. Meanwhile, Palestinian scholars and activists have been have, have, have exposed all of that many years before. Uh, uh, but obviously, we exist within a, a, um, a racialized epistemological order uh, of things where we're, we're always going to be uh, um, uh, mistrusted or, or 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 seen as prone to exaggeration or being unscientific and all the rest of uh, the, 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 all of that racist uh, discourse that is part and parcel of Zionism and colonial modernity. 
Um, uh, so, so yeah, continue to listen to Palestinian voices because they're the ones that are bringing you closest to the re to reality. Not because they're culturally Palestinian or nationally Palestinian, but because they are the ones experiencing these structures of violence and understand them in intimate ways that no one else does. Um, so, so that's a really a, a critical point. And, and in terms of how I theorize or conceptualize apartheid, you know, many other scholars have done this, like Mahmoud Mamdani and, and many others that have situated apartheid within the larger structure of uh, uh, settler colonialism had convincingly showed uh, how apartheid sort of appears, I call it in a recent journal article, a kind of a holding pattern. Uh, uh, where, where the settler colonial conquest kind of uh, um, cannot, you know, explicitly on a mass scale expel the indigenous Palestinians and therefore set, uh, apartheid comes in to kind of uh, uh, cement and naturalize the settler colonial conquest through mass expulsion that already happened and sort of engage in slow, uh, more slow uh, uh, forms of annexation and expulsion. Um, uh, setting the stage for a, for a future event of mass expulsion. Because on the road that we're on and, and following Zionist ideology, they've been telling us this uh, implicitly and sometimes explicitly uh, uh, that, that, that they do want us uh, gone, that they do want the, the entire land to be majority Israeli Jews, uh, with Palestinians making up something like 15 to 20 percent, no more. Um, um, and and, and so, so I view apartheid as a kind of a holding pattern within that larger structure of settler colonial expulsion. And without getting into the sort of nitty gritty details of settler colonialism and what makes settler colonialism settler colonialism, uh, it is in its basic form a structure of expulsion, a, a structure of the a violence of expulsion. Uh, it, it continuously must expel the, the native uh, indigenous Palestinians in order to create uh, um, uh, Israeli Jews, as I would call masters and lords of the land. And that's a critical part of Zionism. Zionism is not an ideology that can be redeemed. It is irredeemable. Desionization is the only path forward for decolonization. Uh, again, we're not the only ones uh, saying this. Many critical anti-colonial scholars have said the same thing as well, non-Palestinians. Um, uh, Zionism can only be a project that uh, operates on raciologies and racial thinking that are part and parcel of colonial modernity, that, that situate Israeli Jews as the uh, 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 superior race to the uh, inferior Palestinians um, and, and uh, uh, cannot but, but produce what I would call masters and lords of the land. Uh, um, uh, you can't you can't redeem a, a, a relationship with a person that starts the the relationship by saying I am your master and lord. There's no there's no dialogue. There's no conciliation that can happen with this. Fana saw this many many decades ago. Uh, other 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 indigenous activists and theorists have saw this many many decades ago. Um, and, and I, I and I would warn here as well on the on the uh, uh, the sort of discourse that paints the problem of Israel as if it's a problem of just ethno-nationalism you know Israel is has now is now an issue because it's now like Hungary uh, and and uh, uh, we just turn to civic nationalism and that'll resolve everything uh, but the problem with that approach is that settler colonialism is not resolved through civic nationalism we have cases of settler colonialism where we can look at how that doesn't work indigenous scholars and activists have said that civic nationalism in a place like Canada did not at all advance decolonization in fact it just became another tool by which uh, uh, indigenous communities were robbed of their sovereign claims um, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, and that's that's the critical part of also settler colonialism. It is that is always the erasure and elimination, not just of individual or uh, sort of individual and collective bodies, but also the elimination of indigenous sovereignty. Uh, and I don't understand sovereignty here in the in the in the strict uh, Euro-American sense. I understand it as a sort of a concept that denotes uh, this very complex relationship that people form between land and people, which appears in many different forms. The Euro-American version of it being the sort of most destructive as far as I'm concerned, and not the one that should uh, limit our understanding of sovereignty. So in addition to human rights as well, and, and going back to the limits of, of this discourse on civic nationalism, which is based on the notion of human rights, we're not asking just for human rights. We've been asking for decades for political sovereign rights, because that's what we are. Uh, and that's not in a zero sum game. Uh, it's it, our, our political sovereign rights do not mean the displacement of Israeli Jewish uh, uh, sovereign existence uh, on the land. It just means a different form of sovereignty that needs to be radically rethought and restructured. Thanks, Mohanad. And, and you know, one of the key points that you you both mentioned that I want to highlight is that you know using the term apartheid is not uh, about equality. That's a that's a liberal reading 
of apartheid, which sort of boils down uh, the issue to this, you know, one person, one vote. Uh, if everyone had the vote tomorrow, um, it would certainly not end uh, Zionist settler colonialism. And we can look at the case of South Africa as an example, you know, it they ended political apartheid, but economic apartheid still very much exists and the lands and the, the wealth of the country still uh, sits in the hands of uh, a very small minority um, of, of settlers in, in South Africa. Um, and so, you know, a more, more radical uh, understanding of ending apartheid or, or establishing an anti-apartheid movement has to be at its core, you know, about decolonization. And there are many different pillars to decolonization, and this is an ongoing discussion um, among indigenous peoples and among Palestinians of what decolonization means and what it looks like. But we already mentioned, you know, some of those core pillars. You know, Mohammed, Mohammed you mentioned, you know, de-Zionization as a core pillar of, of decolonization and justice, of course. Um, uh, and importantly, the, re the repatriation of indigenous life and land. And that sort of tends to be uh, overlooked, especially in, in this day and age when the word decolonization is thrown about uh, in liberal circles as this, uh, as this metaphor, uh, as indigenous scholars have described it, uh, rather than a very uh, uh, real and material process. Um, I'm going to turn to some of the questions now, um, even though I would love to, <laughs> to keep chatting because this is um, such it's so great to be in conversation with both of you, but there are quite a few questions that perhaps I think some of them we've already answered, but perhaps we can make our way um, uh, through some of them, although some of them are very legal, so perhaps I'm, I'm wondering we might skip past this one. Um, so there's one question here about something which we just mentioned about this sort of uh, citizenship all approach um, and it being described as liberal and a decolonization approach, which would be something else. What would successful decolonization lead to an illiberal outcome, something other than a one person, one vote democracy? Um, I think maybe if Mohanad can take the, because I think what he was talking about towards the end really links to this and then I can, um, if he can expand on that because it, it was really interesting and then I can, I can jump in. Sure, yeah, sure. So, so relating to the, to the, uh, um, uh, sorry, what I was talking about at the end in terms of, um, um, you know, uh, the, the move to civic nationalism not being a, a solution, right? Uh, so, so there's two things that I'll let us start with that. First of all, Israel is not turning into one vote, one person. <laughs> they're they're not they're never going to do it uh, because that would be that would be uh, uh, they would de zionize they, they would be beginning on the road to desionization. They would just never do it. Uh, and and settler colonial states only turn to civic nationalism um, once they are pretty much comfortable in their settler colonial conquest of the land. So uh, um, so in a place like Canada. Um, the turn to civic nationalism and the idea of extending citizenship to indigenous communities and all of that, that would have never been on the, on the books in the initial project of, of removing the indigenous people. It's only when they were basically eliminated and, and expelled uh, to, 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 to come to constitute a very small percentage of the, of the population of their overall demographics that then that, that is uh, 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 proffered. And it's not proffered to give them uh, freedom and, and liberation and all of it and decolonization. It's done to uh, push them towards forced assimilation to continue to basically get rid of the Indian problem quote unquote, which was always the, the point of a settler colonial uh, project. So to me, Israel will not actually ever do this. Uh, um, um, but but uh, even if it, if it does, uh, in some sort or another, at this uh, uh, state of demographics, let's say, um, um, it, it, there would be, I, I'm sure, without de-Zionization, there would be, I'm sure, a thousand legal maneuvers that they would use to, to ensure the dominance of Israeli Jews in this context and, and, and their dominance over, uh, um, uh, uh, over the structures of, of, of governance and, and, and political and economic structures and so on. So uh, uh, there is no, you know, for A, it's not on the corner. It won't happen because it would, it would go against what Israel is designed to do. Um, uh, and B, if it happens without de-Zionization, uh, um, then, then it, 
it would just be a continuation of settler colonial uh, uh, domination. And, and, and so it, it, to me, I never understood, like, I, I don't think that Lana or anyone is saying uh, the, a, a decolonized democracy would not be one man, one, one person, one vote, sorry, one person, one vote. It, it could be that, but that's not the definition of democracy, one person, one vote. That's not enough. And that's not, it's certainly not enough for decolonization. It involved much more radical transformation of our systems, uh, state structures. Uh, thank you for this. I just want to add, um, I, I see there is a, there is a comment. Thanks for asking my question. I do hope one of the speakers will attempt to identify either a case of successful decolonization or what it might look like in this case. Um, that really is an anal analytical frontier here. Um, every time we talk about, every time the question of decolonization is raised, this question comes to the fore. There is this kind of a, a, a quest to give a clear answer to what decolonization is or what it could mean. Um, and in many ways, the problem with this question, I think it's an important question. I think we need to talk about what decolonization is. Uh, but whether I can give now a clear outline of, you know, all the strands of decolonization in this kind of pres prescriptive way assumes that decolonization is not an ongoing process that it's it's you know that it's a process that it is an event that could be perfected uh it is not it is a process it's a political project it is a quest so its meaning are constantly changing through social movement demands and so on and so forth but i will ha highlight a few fronts right uh, so in that case, I think that uh, identify a case of successful decolonization, I find it a bit uh, uh, a problematic empirical question. Um, but speaking about South Africa, for example, which for Palestinians is really a, a, a key case, um, um, there have been uh, a particular form uh, of decolonization through civic nationalism, and we saw the limits of that project. We saw that you know, uh, uh, the legacies of racial capitalism and settler colonialism really shaping the inequalities uh, that exist in South Africa today. And this is a risk that Palestinians could run. And Andy Klarno uh, wrote a fantastic book on that. Um, Lubna Kotami also intervened in that space. And uh, uh, Palestinians are recognizing that more and more. I think the question is, how do we dismantle structures of colonialism? How do we dismantle a legal system that is colonial? What do we do with with economic system? How do we engage with the, with the issue of return? How do we not uh, uh, um, uh, uh, create uh, um, a society uh, um, governed by brutal racial capitalism in which uh, uh, um, uh, the Israeli Jewish population continue to control the vast majority? Uh, of the land in Palestine? How do we, do we redistribute uh, um, land, wealth, property? Um, we have the questions of uh, uh, the question of sovereignty and borders and statehood. How do we understand them? Do we want them? We don't want them. This is all up for debate and social movements are intervening in that discourse as well. Um, I think the problem with the citizenship that even if we uh, um, and I agree with Mohanad on this, but even if we go down the route of uh, one person, um, one vote, it's clear that without decolonization, desionification, uh, what we will get uh, is some kind of a version of South Africa. And we need to learn from that experience. Um, so, you know, that kind of discourse of, Oh, but then there will be majority. That's not enough. That is not enough. We know that numbers are only part of the uh, equation when it comes to um, to really adjust building a just future. Um, citizenship is a small part of the conversation. The real struggle is dismantling political, economic, legal, uh, uh, and social 
structures, thinking about patriarchy, thinking about racial capitalism, thinking about all these questions and the ways in which we articulate a decolonized society. And Palestinians will not necessarily agree on that vision. We have neoliberals among us quite few, right? Quite a lot of them. We're not, we're not inherently or essentially anti-capitalist, right? Some of us are, some of us aren't. So there is also a contestation among Palestinians as to you know, what will happen in a liberated Palestine in which uh, uh, you know, Jews and Palestinians will live. Uh, I, I'm sure that, I'm sure that uh, um, there is a particular class that have a completely different, you know, class structures, completely different visions. So we don't agree, we don't have a Palestinian answer. But these are some of the questions that for radical liberationists, uh, 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 decolonial project to happen, this is what we are grappling with at the moment and in the future. And Lana, I just, you know, I, I do want to jump on that and just, you know, I think the when Palestinians are asked this question, it's quite often comes with this implied sort of lack of feasibility. You know, well, decolonization is not feasible. It's not within the realm of possibility. And I think the follow up question of, you know, give me an example of successful decolonization cases compounds that. Um, and I think even in more insidious cases, I think it's also an attempt to shut down the conversation. You know, because if we point to Algeria, for example, where the, the Algerians uh, dismantled French settler colonialism, if we point out that as an example, we're told that, you know, we want to wipe out the settler population. Or if we point to South Africa, as, as you mentioned, we're told that we want to create a minority settler population. So it's almost, I think that question is is deeply problematic and always it almost attempts to, to push us into a corner um, that we can't come out from. And I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head. You know, this is uh, a, an ongoing process. Decolonization is not something that's going to happen um, as an event. Uh, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to, to take time. And there are pillars of decolonization. And I think it is for Palestinians to, to identify um, uh, and to decide on those those pillars. And, and this is something that will take a long time and will not be agreed upon and that will require a lot of hard work and it will be a painful uh, uh, and uh, uncomfortable process. Mohanad, I'm gonna let you jump in here if you want to. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with with, with everything that was said um, and, and it, it won't be easy, but I just wanna encourage people who are have not thought too much about the question of decolonization to to enter it you know enter and there's a rich literature out there whether in activist groups or scholarly works uh, people have been asking these very difficult questions that don't have easy answers about how we bring about a decolonized uh, world what does it look like uh, what kind of uh, uh, strategies are useful for achieving it um, the this is a lively debate within decolonial uh, circles uh, 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 so so for those who have you know, think of decolonization as some just pie in the sky type of thinking or to, um, you know, too unmoored from reality. It's far from it. It's actually the only one that, as far as I'm concerned, is moored in reality. It's the one that's seeing uh, the situation as soberly as possible um, and, and trying to think of uh, and, and calling it unbearable and unlivable for the world's majority, not just for Palestinians, and trying to find ways to, to deal with that. And address it. So um, th there's no agreed universal answer on what decolonization looks like. It's it's a lively debate. There are many discussions about what it, what it what it involves. And 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 but the first thing that you need to know is that you you have to be ready for a whole lot of unlearning to to really understand this this world of decolonization, uh, because uh, the majority of people, are, of course. Uh, uh, you know, their worldview, their symbolic universe, which is not just some natural thing that drops from the sky, symbolic universes come along with all social structures and colonial modernity has been establishing political and social and economic and legal structures for many, many years. And that has come with a symbolic universe that limits what people can see, what they believe is possible and what they believe 
is impossible. And you do have to unlearn that symbolic universe in your process of decolonization. Uh, so you do have to decolonize yourself. It's not an, uh, it's, it won't be just enough to say, I think what is happening is wrong. Uh, uh, you're going to have to do a lot more critical self-reflection and, and self-critique to actually uh, 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 reach that goal. Uh, of, 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 of entering, of just reach goal of entering a decolonial path. It takes effort, it takes time, it won't be easy. Uh, and let me just be clear to avoid the, 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 the stupid questions and accusations, which will come anyway. Um, uh, um, uh, Israeli Jews actually must be and necessarily have to be part of a, a re any real decolonial project. They just can't do it as masters and lords. <laughs> uh, the, and they'll have to design us to properly join that path. But decolonization would be a, a joint effort. Like they, they would be a definite, it has to be that. Um, uh, 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 but but it, it, the, the experience of Palestinians under these structures of violence is the guiding post. That, that cannot be evaded. And it's not because, again, it's not because we're nationally or culturally Palestinian, it's because we're the ones that experience the brutality of those structures of violence, understand them in ways that Israeli Jews don't, uh, even the, the progressive ones, um, uh, and, and understand our aspirations for what a liberated, decolonized life looks like a lot better. But we can't actually get there and build that decolonized world alone. Israeli Jews would have to join that path. Thank you, Mohammed. We will just do two, two more quick questions um, before we bring this discussion to a close. There's a really quick one here that I feel like we can uh, answer. Um, can you say something about the relation between decolonization and Palestinian refugees' right to return? Who, who wants to take that very quickly? Uh, there is no decolonization without return. I mean, uh, that's, that's obvious. Um, right. but I, I, I do think that, you know, return is going to be a very complex project. We're talking about, um, we're talking about population that have lost everything. We're talking about pop population that in its majority is living in poverty, that have lost its land, its, uh, uh property, its houses, its communities have built alternative communities. Um, and it's it's not a it, it, all these aspects and again the redistribution here is a key but not only redistribution but thinking about all these kind of social aspects as well economic social and political aspects um and refugees need to shape their return they know their needs they know how they want their you know they have particular visions or can make their particular visions. Uh, one thing that I would say is there have been several projects on uh, on return. Um, and it's an interesting because it's like, how will the villages look like, right? And then they be, bring architects and planners. And interestingly, uh, especially when, you know, uh, um, Israelis were part of this, this project, you know, Zahrot or and uh, 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 Palestinians, uh, 48ers, citizens. Um, funny enough, a lot of, you know, the visual ways in which towns would look like looked like settlements. Um, and so there is a particular colonization of our imagination as well. Um, and we really need to be careful again was who is he, who is charting these visions of return and who is being excluded uh, from these visions because otherwise we'll you know end up with a Palestine looking like settlements but no that's a you know in, in a joke but um, it's really important again to talk about agency and who is in control of that process and who decides what is important and which considerations need to, to be uh, uh, put forefront. I'm certainly not that person. Um, just So it's very difficult for me to answer this question. I'm not a refugee. Um, so it's difficult for me to weigh in uh, in substantive way. 
I, I just want to, I agree with everything Lana said. I just want to also very quickly add, because you hear this a lot, oh, well, it's too complex. They've been, you know, people have this kind of like evasive uh, uh, disposition towards the refugee problem and they'll use the complexity and they've been going, like, the, but there's people, there's Palestinian scholars and activists that have gone and spent many months and years with refugees. They know what they want. They know, uh, uh, you know, pe people can, we have, we have come up with, uh, 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 you know, uh, political systems have come up with uh, solutions to even bigger problems than this one. It's not an impossible one to resolve. So, so yes, uh, um, uh, I, I don't, I don't take those as if they're in good faith uh, when people say it's too complex or, or it's too big of a problem or any of that sort. Yeah. And I think that's really been a crucial theme of this discussion, you know, pushing beyond the, the realms of the supposed feasibility and possibility, um, because these are notions that have been enforced upon us. We've been told for so many decades what is possible and what is feasible. Um, and they've placed us in this very limited, uh, limited box. And when we sort of smash the, those, those notions, there's really, you know, no limit to what we can imagine and, what, and how we can envision our, our liberation. I'm going to call time because um, we've been going now for an hour and 15 minutes and this discussion has been so great so I want to end it on that note um, and I just want to extend my thanks again to Mohanad Amana for joining me in this second episode uh, of our, our series, uh, Shabaka series. Um, with FMAP on learning and unlearning Palestine. The recording will be available after um, we end this session. And I hope that all of you will join us for the next two sessions that we have planned. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us and for all uh, the people who took the time to come. Thank you. Likewise. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you.